It's evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. And then we were told that we were savages and heathens and things of this nature to create this inferiority complex. But the worst form of enslavement, Brother Rock, and I refer to it like this, how the enemy became the deity and the spiritual subconscious of our mind. What I mean by that is that how they place this image of God in our psyche as a white guy, an old white guy up in heaven looking down. And this is what caused spiritual enslavement to this very day. Good day, beloved. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Rock Newman Show 2.0. Um, I got screamed at earlier uh, by uh, one of the producers who told me that I just don't give enough information to you as to say, as you're watching this, help us grow. Like, I took down their notes, like, subscribe, share, and comment. We really appreciate your viewership. We really appreciate your support here at The Rock Newman Show. And I am absolutely thrilled to be bringing you a brother, to be bringing you a gentleman that has spent 40 years uncovering ancient truth that in my humble estimation, has been covered, recovered, recovered some more, buried, and then recovered some more. And this brother has uncovered so very much. If you've got someone that you think might be interested in ancient African civilization, uh, how Christianity, uh, the impact, of Africa on Christianity and all world religions, really. Call them up. Tell them to tune in the Rock Newman Show 2.0. I want to welcome our brother, Astra Queasy. How are you, brother? Oh, Dante Sana, many thanks, Brother Rock Newman. Honored to be on your show, and I'm doing great. As I said before, I'm, uh, I say I'm rising like, like raw the sun to live again, brother. <laughs> there you go. I am going to do this here. Um, I'm going to read a little blurb here, folks, so you so you know who you're talking to. Ashra Kwesi, as a historian and lecturer on ancient African history and religion, he reveals firsthand information from the ancient temples, tombs, papyrus papers record, recorded when African people were teachers of the world. Brother Kwaisi brings a wealth of information, a powerful delivery based on four decades of study and tour experience in the African Nile Valley. He spent 14 of those years as an assistant to the noted climatologist, Dr. Yosef Ben Yohakim. Brother, let's start here if you don't mind. Give me some reflections. Give our viewers some reflections on Dr. Ben. Well, Dr. Ben, as we refer to him as the grand master teacher, in fact, uh, my journeys to the original Tanetter land or the original Holy Land in the northeast corner uh, in Kemet called Egypt today. Uh, if it was not for him, uh, I would not be doing what I'm doing. As you mentioned, I spent 14 years with him and many others who are also conducting tours, Dr. Ben. He uh, parted the waters for us to return back to do educational tours, as he said, education for liberation. And Dr. Ben, he spoke, he spoke to the grassroot element of our people. As he said, you know, we should always speak the language of the people. As Dr. Ben has he always pointed out, he always brought humor into uh, his lectures and his speaking. And at the same time, uh, he uh, pointed out and revealed uh, at the uh, a lot of the stories that Europeans have told us and literally, you know, <laughs> cause us to laugh at, which we should laugh at, because after all, they cause us to laugh at our own spiritual systems, our own spiritual stories. Uh, so Dr. Ben is one who, as I said, we refer to him as the grand master teacher that he went for the jugular vein of white supremacy and the jugular vein of white supremacy 
is the Western religion because it was uh, stolen and uh, corrupted from the ancient spiritual system of the Nile Valley, from the ancient temples and tombs, which he spent many years, uh, and I spent many years uh, working under him, as you just mentioned, 14 years, and revealing this from the reliefs. The Books in Stone has uh, revealed this to us. And uh, during the comparative analysis, uh, we can see where without question, without the ancient African spiritual system, uh, what we know as the Western version of Christianity, as well as other religions, whether it's Judaism, uh, Islam, Buddhism, uh, Krishna, and the various religions we have. It was not for the fallopian tube. I uh, refer to the fallopian tube as the Happy Valley, uh, as our ancestors referred to it as happy. It is called the now today, that 4,000, approximately 200 miles of the now of this ancient spiritual system from our ancestors' empirical observation, as Dr. Ben uh, in, in fact, the first book I came in contact was Black Man of the Now, and he uh, had on the cover of that old book of 1972, the whole 4,200 miles of the Now, as well as the Abai, known as the Blue Now of Ethiopia, and showing that was the cultural highway of our ancestors' empirical observation of Mutt Nature to Mother Nature that they observed for countless thousands of years before the Western religions were even in existence, my brother. So and, he, and, and and I I I read in in preparation uh, mm -hmm. for to today's interview that tell me if I read this right that that Doctor Ben for the most part covered the entire distance of the Nile. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And and I want to say to my viewers here who you know we we mentioned four thousand miles, forty two hundred miles, whatever whatever it is. I was taking my puppies for a walk this evening. And, you know, when I got to three miles, I was tired. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so for 4,200 miles, I don't think that in the continental United States, east to west, north, certainly not north to south, there is... It's not 4,200 miles anywhere. I, I live here in, in Boca Raton. I lived in Washington, D.C. I drove from Las Vegas and from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. That was 2,500 miles. There was another 400 miles I could go, and, all, and I would be in the Pacific Ocean. So when you think about that man's dedication mm -hmm. and the work he put in, that he covered the entire Nile, over 4,000 miles, what a feat, what an accomplishment. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, one of his favorite quotes is he quoted from the papyrus of uh, Hunefer that we came from the beginning of the Nile where God happy dwelt at the foothill, the mountain of the moon. And that's where the Nile starts at is Lake Nianza, it, uh, now called uh, uh, after uh, Lake Victoria, the colonialized name. I uh, was with him at the Mountain of the Moon. I uh, returned back there with him back in the 80s, as well as the highlands of Ethiopia. Uh, we speak of the 4,200 uh, miles coming from Uganda, but at the same time, you also have the Blue Nile coming out of the highlands of Ethiopia. This is the cultural highway, uh, so to say. So from those two, uh, from the highlands of Ethiopia and also from Lake uh, Nianza, starting from Uganda, so actually, it would be over four thousand miles when you include Ethiopia. You know, you bring up you bring up Ethiopia. Um, I, I certainly, you know, you have such a wealth of information. I want to try to get as much from you as I can. I want to remind folks: you will be uh, just outside of Washington D.C. in Capitol Heights, Maryland, at E Life uh, Everlasting used to be called Everlasting Life Restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Baruch's uh, place there in mm -hmm. Capitol Heights. That's our. Uh, uh, Saturday, December the 9th, it starts at 6 uh, p.m. You bring up Ethiopia, and it, it, it will send me right to one of the notes that I made that I wanted to discuss with you. Um, you presented findings on ancient Kush in Ethiopia at the uh, Adi Ababa University. Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. Yes, which is the former palace of Emperor Haile Selassie. What, what do you remember about that moment, about that time where you're ultimately in the house that was the house 
of Halle Selassie, the palace? Mm. Well, first of all, it's, it's, um, it's a museum now uh, yeah. and, and reflecting on the history of Halle Selassie and uh, all that he endured to maintain uh, his, uh, his throne in Ethiopia, especially during the time when the Italians invaded and uh, caused all type of uh, atrocities on, on Ethiopia and how he was able to maintain Ethiopia to um, not to be colonized. Uh, as it says that Ethiopia, although occupied, but never colonized. In fact, uh, my wife and I did a piece on Ethiopia uh, called From the Ancient Kushites to the Black Lions. And uh, she dealt with the part. She loved the history dealing with uh, Haile Selassie and during that era of the emperors, of the Tuodros and, and others. And I'm dealing with ancient Kush. So, uh, yeah, reflecting back on and, and traveling through this uh, massive palace of uh, Haile Selassie, that, uh, that this man who at the time, at one time, he was on Time Magazine. He was known as the emperor of the world at the time. So it was a very a powerful and moving experience. In fact, I lectured uh, there so you, as part of the university there. I lectured at the Hall of Ali Sababa. In fact, uh, there were about 400 students there, uh, my wife and I, uh, when we lectured on the history of ancient Ethiopia. So it was a very powerful and moving experience to uh, not only be there, but actually walking in the very house that he actually lived is now part of the university now. So in fact, it was endorsed by the government itself who uh, was involved in giving us a stamp of approval, uh, letting my wife and I lecture uh, at, uh, at the Addis Ababa University. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, as a youthful knuckle <clears throat> knuckle-headed 16 year old, uh, this is 1968, so in the schools that had just integrated, we integrated a school, uh, Gwen Park High School is where I went in, in Southern Maryland, Brandywine, Maryland. And man, I was happy to hear I'd become, you know, a little bit conscious having read Malcolm X and uh, uh, Man Child in the uh, Promised Land, you know, like Claude yeah. Brown. And, um, you know, a huge fan of Muhammad Ali. Uh, they told us, hey, there's going to be a black history class. And it was at one of the other schools in the county. So it happened. I think we went two nights a month. Uh, that's how much they really thought about black history. <laughs> but I went and I remember hearing about, you know, the Kush and the Moors and, you know, that. And the truth be told, I went to Gwen Park High School. There was a school in the county, uh, Fairmont. And one of their, uh, just a really cute cheerleader was in that class. And all of my focus and attention was on her. And it wasn't on the black history that I should have been trying to learn. When you speak of the Kush, do me a favor, and hopefully it's a favor to those watching in also. If you would talk about the Kush and it's their impact on the world during that time and why they so much have been minimized throughout history over the last few hundred years? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, there would not be an Egypt, as our ancestors referred to Egypt as Kemet, so there would not be a Kemet without Cush. Cush is, in fact, the mother of Egypt. Uh, in fact, at one time, the Europeans and still even today still look at the fact that Egypt colonized uh, ancient Ethiopia or ancient Kush, but that was not the case. Uh, people like Bruce uh, Williams, uh, I think his name is Bruce Williams, where he did some excavations down in the area of Wadi Halfa and validating that Kush was, in fact, the mother of Egypt prior to building the dam down there. It's called Lake uh, Nasser today. Uh, when they built that lake, that lake there, it uh, flooded out a lot of the treasures of ancient Kush. In fact, the threat of the 200, over 200 pyramids that are in fact in Kush, those are equally under threat of the new uh, dams that they're going to build uh, called the Kutch Bar and the uh, Al Sharif Dam. If they build these dams, here we see the greatest African treasures on the continent of these 200 pyramids built by the Kushites 
uh, those pyramids will be flooded out. And yet uh, many of us are totally oblivious to, oblivious to this. In fact, it's not getting any uh, recognition from CNN or BBC at all. Uh, and the Chinese are ones who are, uh, are going to be involved in building these dams. Uh, so, but there are excavations. There, the excavations that are going on in Kush is not on the level that we see what the European Egyptologists have done in Egypt. But there has been some that has been done, like I spoke of uh, Bruce Williams, and uh, I can't think of the other European right off the top of my head who did excavations down in that area. Uh, but and by travels into uh, Kush, into that area, uh, in Maserat with Dr. Ben back in the early 80s, and uh, also in the area of Jua. Uh, Jua would be the uh, name that uh, the Arabs refer to as uh, Jerba Bakel. And there we see the holy mountain of Amun. Uh, this is the Amun that we see in Egypt during the Middle Kingdom. So when we look at the history of Egypt and seeing that this spiritual black divinity, by the way, that we still see at the end of our prayers, Amun, because it's the Greeks who grabbed Amun and took Amun to the Western world, but that Amun starts in Jua. All right, or Jebba Pakel, as the Arabs refer to it, of this holy mountain dedicated to Amun. Uh, keep in mind, this is long before there was a mountain of Moses going up into it, it was the mountain of Amun. Uh, that, that represents the invisible spirit. It's in all of us, the invisible spirit that uh, permeates, uh, permeates throughout the whole universe. And he's identified as jet black. He's jet black. Uh, again, recognizing uh, not only Cush, but we can even say what the physicists are referring to as dark matter invisible energy and uh, all those types of things. So again, now that there is some research have been done in Kush, we can see the beginning starts in the south. In fact, we can even go further and see that our ancestors referred to in Kemet, they referred to the mountain of the moon as I opened up with. They referred to as happy. They referred to the little twa, okay? And Kemet you know, referred to as best. So, and uh, these are the little twa, derogatory name called the pygmies, okay, by the Europeans. Uh, so they understood that the Kui land or the spirit land definitely was inner, inner Africa. Okay. They, it did not come from somewhere else. It didn't come from Asia. It didn't come from Europe. It didn't come from somewhere uh, outside of Africa. It all started in inner Africa. After all, anthropology now have validated that humanity started in Africa, even though the, the leakies, okay, who let it all leak out. Okay. That's where it began. But now they have not acknowledged that the spiritual systems, that led into religions equals equally started in Africa. Can it's I ask you a question? Can I mm -hmm. ask you a question? Now? You, you said the leaky, the leaky, uh, they were anthropologists. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and from where I made a little joke about it. They let it leak out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> and because yeah. what you're describing is such a powerful and rich history that when we when we were separated and lost all of our identity you're talking about kush and you know i kind of really was you know you know quasi interested in the history that they were supposedly teaching when they were talking about kush but as I said, I didn't I didn't pay as much attention. What I, what I'm drawing a line and connecting the dots to is right now in cities throughout this country, there are young kids, 12, 13, 14 years old, who are rolling up to a gas station with a pistol, fake pistol, knife, whatever. Hmm. And they're saying stuff like free ride, free ride. Mm. And they're jet trying to jack people, mm. take their cars mm. and run off. Mostly, mostly young men. And the point I'm making is if we understood or knew any of this history and understood the kings that we were, it makes it would make such an incredible difference and the impact the effect of pervasive global white supremacy contributes to this kind of disease in our community right now and so brother i want to take my hat off to you for the work that you're doing 
the presentations that you make, that you make, it is so needed and it's so needed by so many more. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for 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 what you're doing. Um, I br I brought up the term white supremacy, and I'm gonna ask you to take off on it in turn because you have the knowledge, unique knowledge of the history of this ancient land and how powerful it was and how important it was to people who wanted to destroy us as a people to cover it up and to hide it never to be seen again. Mm. Well, first of all, uh, Brother Rock, the evidence is there. Okay, so it's not like a mystical world. It's not like a place that it used to be. Uh, a lot of people speak of things that used to be. Uh, a lot of people speak of uh, religion, is, which is allegory and mythology. Uh, when we come to Africa and we come back to the northeast corner of Africa and to those monuments and temples, as though they knew, our ancestors knew, that one day we would not know this story. We went through the Ma'afa as an African people, the kidnapping of African people from the African continent, and the process of how do you make a slave? Uh, taking away our identity, taking away our history. And from that time, we have been circumscribed to think within a white supremacy circumference of their time. And everything that we were taught has been what they have done. So, of course, this is what we think that, and then we were told that we were savages and heathens and things of this nature to create this inferiority complex. But the worst form of enslavement, Brother Rock, and I refer to it like this, how the enemy became the deity and the spiritual subconscious of our mind. What I mean by that is that how they place this image of God in our psychic as a white guy, an old white guy up in heaven looking down. And this is what caused spiritual enslavement to this very day. Even in my neighborhood right now, this is the epitome of white supremacy. When we speak of white supremacy, this is the epitome of it right now. Why? In my neighborhood where I live here in Dallas, Texas, a black neighborhood, the school is right down the street. Children, they are walking down the street by all the yards that all the black folks have down here. And in those yards, they have plastic white babies in the yard with a plastic white mother, and a plastic white father, and they are told that that is the Holy Family. Okay, so this is what we refer to as the epitome of white supremacy, and also how these images were placed down in our consciousness. So when the children see this as they walk to school, okay, and their whole idea of the angelical realm, peace be upon him, was Dr. Clark, our grandmaster teacher, another grandmaster teacher, as he told us, they colonized the afterlife. So black folks were brainwashed to think that even the afterlife, that white folks were in control with this too. And as another great teacher, Khalid Abdul Muhammad used to say, we must have been in the kitchen cooking the meal. <laughs> this is a good friend of mine used to say that, Brother Khalid. So when we think of the images that's going on right now, OK, that this is a European holiday coming up on us right now. And everything about that holiday is a European culture. OK. And in that process, what is it doing to the minds of our people to see images? Even the guy coming from the North Pole. Of all places, the North Pole, you can't. I mean, when you get to Norway, I mean, that's white, white. But when you get to the North Pole. And this is the images and representation that our children are getting at this time. And even the stories about the virgin birth story. This, I'm coming to, I, I lecture this time of the year because I think this is very extremely important because of the monuments and temples validate where these stories were our ancestors for thousands of years from their empirical observation of observing cosmic events, solar events, 
meaning at this time they saw that this was going into the birth of the son and through the birth of the son personified as a great Nisu that would be born. Not Jesus. There was no Jesus stories. This was a story of Haru that's documented on the Mimason Temple. One of the temples we go to is one of the temples called Enetneter in Dandara, a place called Dandara. And there we see the goddess name Het Heru. And her, and she represented Murray. Do we have to ask ourselves, where this Murray, where's this name Murray? During the time of these ecumenical conferences that the Europeans had, and during the time when they were corrupting ancient Kushite Kemetic spiritual systems, is this where they de Africanized many of the spiritual systems of Africa at the Conference of Ephesus in 431 AD and made a Mary from Murray, meaning love? And the sheet's going to have this holy birth that's told at the temple of Aptu, the world's first holy city. That's also told at the temple of uh, Inetneta that we take groups there. Haru is born in a chapel that they even have in their own tour books, Brother Rock. That some Europeans have become angry when they got the Egyptian tour books telling of Haru's holy birth in this chapel. Now, why would they get angry? Because they were told and and taught to believe that this Jesus would be born at December the 25th, but yet Haru predates this story by thousands of years. And this became a problem for many of the European tourists who came there. When we go to the Temple of Aset, called the Temple of Isis today, I know that we know about the Notre Dame, we know about the Westminster Abbey, but there would not be any Westminster Abbey or Notre Dame's if it was not for the temples of ancient Kemet. After all, though, even the Western churches are designed off of the ancient Kushite Kemet temples, the oblong shape. The steeple of the church came from the Tekanus, called Oblix today. But in this temple of Aset, here we see she had to hide in the papyrus swamps because there was an evil man named Set. Set was out to kill him in this spiritual mythology story of ancient Kemet. So she had to go hide in the papyrus swamps. Is this the story where we get also with Jesus who had to go and hide from Herod? And the epiphany. You, about- you, 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 you just used the word that I want to pull out. I want to pull out your sentence there. You said myth. And spiritual mythologies. Yeah. Spiritual mythology. And so, you know, Telling the truth, shaming the devil, or telling the truth and letting the letting let let let, let it fall where it falls. <laughs> part of part of what I want clarity for, and with your deep study, you can communicate, you know, so much better than I ever could. And that's why I love having guests that know a lot more than me. I know I've got folks out here who are religious. Black folks in America Mm. are the most religious, perhaps the most religious people on earth. And and there's a reason for that. What you're doing is you use that term myth. And as I said, I want to lift it out and expand it because you said ancient African spiritual myths, which... How there are those that believe today fervently about the little manger in Bethlehem Mm. and with those white kids, you said the little white babies in in Dallas and go to church. (laughs) Grandma and mama and the aunts and they tell that to our kids today. And, you know, hitting the nail on the head is that is harmful to us as a people. That's harmful? Harmful. What what I'm saying is harmful Mm -hmm. is taking that mythology, making it real to them and having Mm -hmm. them, having these kids that that are walking past. Right. Yeah, that's harmful. Yeah. Yeah. That's very harmful. Yes, That's sir. very, 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 har- harmful very harmful 
mm-hmm. and contributor, contributory to some of the anti-social, anti-humane behavior that it, that exists today. And everything is done to kind to perpetuate that greatest story, that greatest lie ever told. And, you know, some people will be very upset with me. You know, I've got people in my family who are deeply, profoundly religious. And oh, think, we all do. And think, think right now that, you know, this is utter blasphemy. But I, I, you know, we can't, we can't keep playing. As my good friend Dick Gregory said, so much. You got a big job. Oh yes. But that with the, with the main thing, brother Rock, is that they took away our black divinity. When we see these images and representations, as we mentioned, the plastic white babies, the myth story, and the, the white Jesus, the angelical realm is being Europeanized. Then what that does it kills our own black divinity, our own black divine representation. So when you brought up to our children in, in terms of uh, some of our youth out there who are killing themselves, meaning killing each other is literally killing themselves. Okay, to kill another black man, they're killing themselves. This is the killing at the depth of their own black divinity. The self-hatred that was created and the process of looking at something else outside of yourself as being divine and you being undivine. As we know the whole story, it goes back to the time when we were a child, when our mother was cooking that angel's food cake. And that chocolate cake was a devil's food cake. So all these little negative terms and things that were used was planted deep in the psyche of our children, even ourselves, yeah, even myself. Okay. Yeah. We had to go through our own personal liberation to get out of that. And that's why Kemet plays such an important role. It was not until I went back there to see the evidence carved in stone where the, the, the protetas are known as tombs of eternity. This is a thousand years after the pyramids. The pyramids will blow your mind, but they're going into the tombs. Here you see all this black divinity black divine representations of the spiritual afterlife that our ancestors carved on these tombs. This is what the Europeans saw when they came into Kemet. This is what they observed. This is what they said they had to kill that black divinity. When I spoke of the black god, Amun, being jet black, that the Greeks even worshiped the black god, Amun. The Greeks called him Amun Jupiter. And the uh, Romans called him Amun Zeus. No, the Greeks called him Amun Zeus and the, and the Romans called him Amun Jupiter. And the, the Byzantine Romans eventually called him Amun that we still think of our prayer. Can you imagine if our children knew that every time they said Amun at the end of their prayer, they're referring to a black God? How would that lift their own black divinity, their own spir- spiritual black representation? Yes, yes, yes. Hmm? Yes. This is, this is the power that, we're, that we're, we're talking about. And this is why it's so important that the fact that we have the evidence, we have the proof, we can put it in our own mental court along. I come with visual documentation. I don't, I don't come for people to believe in what I say. Okay, but to think about what I say. We have a cerebral organ called the brain. That's what it's used for, to think. You can believe in a whole lot of things. All right, but it doesn't mean it's facts. And so many of the religions have taught people to believe in things. Some of us, Brother Rock, are born and we have been taught to believe everything. And some of us are born and want to know that which is not being told. I've always asked questions from the time that I was a child. And I used to ask that preacher, why don't we have any black angels up there on a stained glass window? You know, that was going the time of the 60s, the black power movement and everything. Yeah. So, of course, I'm, you know, why don't we have any black angels? He said, the devil must be in me to even ask the question. You see, so that. At nine years old, that's when I asked, when I told myself, I'm going to find out what this is all about. At nine. And I, and I took the longest journey in my life. Mm-hmm. And what journey was that? The journey into myself. Yes, yes, yes. And there's Dr. Richard King, peace be upon him. I had to open up an African ancestral genetic memory bank that is still there. It's lying dormant in many of us. And that's why we have the great inspiration and pride when we start to see 
the evidence of what African people have done. But unfortunately, in many cases, we don't have access to our own children. The enemies of our people have access to our children. They're still teaching them the same thing that caused the brain uh, enslavement on even us. And we had to go through our own personal emancipation. Yeah. <laughs> Mental yeah. emancipation, that is. Yeah. Yeah. And right now, right now, though, those those formative brains are being bombarded by the music industry. Oh, yeah. The lyrics. I mean, yes, that, that that's the genocide right there with the music. You know, take control. I mean, look at the music we had back in the 60s, the love songs we sang to each other, the, the yeah. political uh, lyrics that were. You know, so they, they observed that. Yeah. They saw the movements that came out of that movement. Yeah. All right. So, of course, now you pay young people millions of dollars to create genocide on our own people and all kind of decadent behavior in the music. And I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I mean, some of the stuff that I that some people have sent to me on the, and, and looking at, I mean, it's just. Uh, you know, we really going through a whole mental and psychological and demoralized state right now yeah from 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 the lyrics that come from this garbage not understanding and i'd like for you to help us with this that the world's first language and writings came from the areas that you right now are talking about I was speaking to someone today and made mention of just that. Mm -hmm. And they asked the question, well, why don't you ask him what's his proof? Oh, we got the proof. <laughs> Come share to the lecture, you'll please. see the proof. <laughs> yeah. Can, can, can you share with us that that is most profoundly demonstrates that out of the areas that you now talk about, the Nile, Ethiopia, Kemet, that it was the the proof of it being the first language and the first writings. Well, where can we go on the planet Earth to see the oldest writing that is referred to by Medu Nichir, sacred language of God, if we translate it to English today? The Hebrew language does not predate the Medu Nichir. Aramaic does not predate the Medu Nature. Hebrew does not predate the Medu Nature. Arabic does not predate the Medu Nature. English does not predate the Medu Nature. Here we see the oldest language written on the books in stone. Everywhere you look, you see the language. You see concepts in that language that have been plagiarized from these books in stone and incorporated into, in some cases, in the writings in the Bible. Like if I say Neb Kadu, Lord, King of Kings, where does that come from? Sa Ra. The Nessus or the Kings were referred to as Sa Ra, Son of God. They literally plagiarized that from the temple and put it on, as I refer to as a Serapis Jesus. I refer to a Serapis Jesus because it is that Jesus, Serapis, that the Romans came along. Even before them, it was the Greeks who had Serapis who wanted to be worshipped on the throne. So they took a sar, a sar in the ancient creation story of ancient Kemet, long before Genesis. Here we see the creation story in Kemet of a sar and a set. By the way, they were created simultaneously. They did not have the hatred towards the woman. There was no rib taken from a sar. Okay. This is the spiritual system of ancient Kemet. And through that union, they have that holy child of Haru. But when the Greeks came on the throne, they took a sar and formed him into Serapis, literally made him white. Asar is always referred to also as jet black in his image when we see Asar. In fact, he was known as the Lord of the perfect black. Asar represented the salvation and resurrection because he was equally crucified by his evil brother named Set. Some even say that's where the term even Satan came from, Set. And out of that story, he becomes the one that represents salvation and resurrection into the spiritual life. But it was the Greeks who corrupted Asar into making of the Serapis. And all the stories of Asar and Aset and resurrection, holy birth, 
all of those stories were incorporated into the European Western world, first starting with the Greeks, then the Romans, and when the Byzantine Romans, they finally formulated their Western version of Christianity, first starting with when Octavian defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra. That's when they knew that they had to formulate a new religion because when he, at the time, was fighting Cleopatra, she said, I am a set. She wasn't, but she was personifying herself as a set, or Isis, as the Greeks called her. Okay. And they worshipped her. The, the, the Greeks, who were the first to worship a set, the Romans worshipped her. They took her throughout their empire. So when you go to Europe, Brother Rock, why do you see these black Madonnas there? Yeah. These black Madonnas, because the Romans brought her there as a set. And when the, the Byzantine Romans took over, that they made her marry. But she was originally the black Madonna of Kemet, known as a set. So when you go to Notre Dame in France, you go to England, you go to Germany and these various places in Europe, and you see this black Madonna. That's because when the Romans at one time worshipped her. So Augustus Caesar worshipped her too. So that's why Cleopatra said, I am a set. He said, we got to change this. That's when they slowly started to formulate the Western version of Christianity. And I'm going through it very quick because it's a very detailed story. Sure. And that, when you go to the temple of, a, uh, of Dendera, dedicated to Hederu, you see Cleopatra on the, on the back of that temple with the throne of a set on her head. But you also see the goddess Hederu with her face smashed out because they were destroying her. Her zoop type is a cow. Now, the question we got to ask, why is that cow in the manger, Brother Rock? It, I mean, when they talk about Kemet, they say it's animal worship. Is that right? Yeah. That cow is in the manger because that is Hederu. They left it in the manger in the, in the pictorial images that we see in the representation of the Yuletide. But our ancestors were the ones who saw that this was the time of the winter solstice and the birth of the sun. And you know what they called it, Brother Rock? It was the time of the Kames. Ka was spirit and mess is birth. Yeah. Later on, they took that and called it Christmas. Yeah. You know, I can't, oh, six months, eight months ago, I did a post on Facebook, and it was real simple. I said, teach your young about Imhotep. Grandmaster, 5,000 years ago. If you, with all of your time, your four decades of study, I just would like for you to comment, characterize, illuminate Imhotep. Imhotep is the world's first multi-genius. A multi-genius being an astrophysicist, world's first physician. At least that's what we see documented in Kemet. Let's go to the Pra'ank. Back to the temples again. The evidence is there. The Pra'ank is the house of life. That would be referred to today as hospitals. Here we see medical instruments. Their Imhotep is carved on the temple. But when you see Imhotep, his head has been cut off by the Europeans who came in. And one sister who was with us broke down and cried, who was a medical doctor. And I said, why are you crying? She said, I'm a medical doctor. I had to go to med school. Nothing was told to me about Imhotep. And these are the same medical instruments that I use to this very day. And Not I see them carved in stone. And I had to take the Hippocratic oath that I had practiced medicine according to that of Asclepius. She didn't know that Asclepius, that is the Greek name for Imhotep, a multi-genius. Here, this great comedic African built the world's first stone building in an area called Saqqara. Still there. In fact, it was uh, open for the first time, okay, for groups to go in two years ago. In 2021, when we started our trips back after the uh, pandemic, and we literally are walking inside Brother Rock. This structure built by Imhotep for his Nesu or King Zolzer Netriket. Zolzer Netriket. In fact, I have our book right here, Imhotep. 
Because one of the things we did, we created our book so brothers and so young, our young people can get into these personalities of Imhotep. A multi-genius. Built this structure for him. We're literally walking inside of a structure that's over 5,000 years old. Where on the planet Earth, Brother Rock, can you walk inside of a structure over 5,000 years old outside of Africa? You just held up a this book. black man, M. Hotel. You, you just M. held up a book. I, I'm, I got, I'm not, we're not, we're not hardly finished. But I usually do this at the end, but I want to do it now after you're holding up that book. How can the viewers like, contact here's you? Motep, here's Imhotep right here. Yes. Right yes. there in our book. Imhotep. How can, how can the viewers uh, 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 reach out to you, find you, go to your site? What, what Can you share that information with us? Yes. Uh, they can go to our website at kemetnew.com. Uh, Kemet, Kemet New means black people, by the way. So that's Kemet and New. You spell K- new. You spell new in you. Yes, sir. And uh, that's spelled K E M E T N U dot com. And there we have uh, videos, uh, DVDs, and uh, you can even bring it up on your TV. We have some of those, our book, uh, because in the comfort of our home, some people, you know, you they, they, they can get black back, black back to themselves in the comfort of their own living room. But at the same time, we're going to have this lecture that's coming up uh, on the 9th. It's going to be a very powerful lecture dealing with the origin of Christianity and the Christmas holiday. I mean, after all, th- th- this is all about European customs, Brother Rock. You know, I mean, here, the pine, the pine tree is a germ. The Germans brought that tree to America. Everybody's running around cutting down trees. Uh, brother got a tree on top of his car, going down the street, drinking a bottle of Blue Nun or Paradise wine. Yeah. All right. And here, why? Why that tree? Why did the Germans worship that tree? Brother Rock, they worshiped that tree because all of nature became barren in the Germanic tribes but that pine tree. And that tree represented Thor, that Thursday's named after. In fact, the days of the week are named after Germanic tribes. Monday for Moon's Day, Tua for Tuesday, well, Wednesday for Woden, Thursday for Thor, Freya, that's also uh, the mother. And they bow down and worship that tree. So in order to get your gift, what do you have to do? Put it under the tree. Go under the tree and get it. You got to bow down and get bow your down. gift. So you're still bowing down to Thor. It's a Germanic custom. So in Jeremiah, that's why some people say they go buy the Bible. Where in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2 and 6, it says, do not take the way of the heathen. Where heathen is a German term. Okay, that means heath dweller. One is uncivilized because when the Romans were trying to convert the Germanic tribes over to uh, Roman Catholicism, here they still kept their customs. So to, to convert them, they let them keep their customs. So that's why you got a merger of uh, this the Jesus story, okay, this a corruption of ancient Kemet, but at the same time you got the Germanic tribes, the tree, and you got Satanilia, which is uh, which they refer to as Santa Claus. It also comes out of Rome. And uh, also Greece, he was called Cronus. Now, anyone can go to their phone and look up Cronus and, and punch in Cronus and you'll see he's an old white guy eating his babies. He didn't bring them gifts. He ate them because he feared they would grow up and take the throne. So blood is flowing down the baby. So when you see that elf attached to the candy cane, we're talking about symbolism here, Brother Rock. So the, the, the elf attached to that candy cane symbolized Cronus who ate his babies. Now, that's, now it's, it's when we start to break the matrix of white supremacy, it's hard sometimes because, like we said in the beginning, people have been taught to believe these things. Our families, this is a, a time, I mean, I understand, Brother Rock. I mean, that teen cold comes on, it's almost a meltdown for me, yeah. right? As, but, you know, we were taught at uh, the time that I was a child, you know, it was a happy time. But at the same time, one has got to ask, do you want to be free or do you want to be an eternal slave to somebody else's culture? Do you want to find yourself in white idolatry or worshiping white images? Or you want to come back into your own black divinity and worship your own black divinity? That is freedom. Because if you don't see your own black divinity, we as an African people will not go into eternity, Brother Rock. And we are rooted in singing Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells. 
or dreaming of a white Christmas. Dreaming of a white Christmas. Right. Yeah. You see, talking about Rudolph, conquer, talking about Rudolph and his and, and his boys or girls. Right. When a conqueror comes in, a conqueror, that's what a conqueror does. He makes sure that the people that they are conquering, that they are locked into the culture and customs of the conqueror. Okay. And that way, they it will always be a control. And then worst of all, the, mass, the, the, the multinational corporations, they're laughing all the way to the bank. Sure. This is the time you got suicides and homicides and everything. People are depressed. Yeah. Some people maxing out their credit cards at this time of the year. So I'm saying that the presentation is for brothers and sisters to come out and, not, and you will not find yourself in this depressed state when you understand mm -hmm. truly what this is all about mm -hmm. and see how it was corrupted from our ancient African spirituality. And we have the monuments and temples to validate it. And, 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 you know, I don't have any doubt without hearing, you know, well, I've heard some of your, your, your lectures, but I haven't ever been with you in person, but people, if they listen closely to this truth, they can start, start to identify the God that serves each individual best. And that's the God within. You talk about do presentations on the sacred African knowledge hidden in America. I want to touch that's on a that. A Masonic lecture I do. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Can you uh, share a little bit about what you teach there? Oh, wow. That's, yeah. In fact, I was just in Baltimore a couple of weeks ago lecturing to a Masonic lodge on that sacred knowledge and, and meaning that Africa speaks to us all the time. It speaks to us through symbols. But of course, if we don't know the history behind the symbol, we never get the message. If yeah. you hold, one holds up a cross, you don't have to say anything. You know what that cross means. Mm -hmm. okay. Even though that was a corruption, that's an ancient African symbol that was corrupted by the Romans as well. But that's a whole nother story. Father, so, Son, and Holy Ghost. Right. Wow. <laughs> Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You're right. The Trinity, they call it. Uh, so again, so when we look at the symbols that are all around us, I spoke of the Tekanu earlier, you know, that we see all over the world. Every conqueror that came in took one of those Tekanus. In fact, there's over 13 in Rome itself. When we look at America today and we look at the very fact that we open up our wallets and we pull out our wallets and pull the money out of our wallets. Uh, this is a, a Christian country. It doesn't have a cross on it on the dollar bill. It has a pyramid on the dollar bill. Why is it in 1934 that Roosevelt decided to put a pyramid on the dollar bill, even though when the Europeans were uh, like uh, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, they were all using comedic symbols. OK, uh, even Francis Hopkinson. OK, who uh, at this time, how do we come up with the American flag? Now, that's very deep right there. All one has to do is go to 16th Street and see where Albert Pike, who the one who started the Ku Klux that became the Ku Klux Klan, all right, where he's buried at. Uh, in fact, he wrote the Morals and Dogma, which is the Bible of the Masonic Order. But in their Ankh-Manu or Holies of Holies, there in that uh, uh, temple in uh, 16th Street, Washington, D.C., they have this cloth and it's red, white and blue. And on the cloth is Osiris and Isis. That's the Greek name for a sar and a set. And I asked the curator, why do you have, I act like I didn't know. Yeah. Why do you have a sar and a set on this cloth, red, white, and blue? And he said, well, that's a secret. I knew what the secret. Let's go back to the great temples again, like Medina Habu. And there you see the columns are red, white, and blue. Why are they red, white, and blue? It represents the helical rising of this star called Sibyl Septa that represented Isis. That happens at December 25th, by the way, back to Christmas again. It told them that a rule would be born. So when Francis Hopkinson, when that star rose in ancient Kemet in the Meridian, it turned red, then white and blue. And it told them that Haru would be born of the holy birth. They took that idea, the Masonic Lodge, and put that cloth in there to represent the original secret. OK, that's why the early church, the early European church shut down the, Mas the Masons. Because the Masons knew where the original knowledge came from. Mm 
Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. They knew that it came from Kemet. So they still practice, especially in that morals and dogma. Kemet is all in the morals and dogmas of Alpha Phi. All that sacred knowledge is tied in there. When you look at George Washington on the Capitol building in the stained glass, and he's he's in an ancient Kemet, what is called the Nisiem suit. That's one knee down on the square, one arm over the heart, and one arm up. Okay. That's called the Nisiem suit. That means on the square that you'll be, you'll be of truth and justice and righteousness. Now, now, Brother Brock, this is deep right here. I show brothers and sisters on the temple of Haru of the Nisu king kneeling on the square that represents truth, justice, and righteousness of Ma'at. To be of truth, justice, and righteousness. That he has one knee down on the square and one warm one over his heart because your heart had to be judged on the scales of Ma'at with the feather of Ma'at to be yeah. scaled even, that yes. now becomes just us with the justice symbol that we see mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. justice system. Mm-hmm. But can you imagine if Kopenek, if they knew that when they took that knee, can you imagine if they showed that relief from that temple and said, we want truth, justice, and righteousness for the slaughter of black men by the police force around the country? And then also validating the fact that you're going to holler at them for taking a knee and you got George Washington on the Capitol building taking a knee and you where that was copied from the ancient African Kemetic temples of the Nile Valley with those brothers taking a knee that represents truth, justice and righteousness. Can you imagine if they showed that? This is the information that I revealed at that Masonic Lodge. Also from the books in stone. Because even though they robbed the papyruses, the thousands of papyruses, when we see when Alexander, who came in and got Aristotle to plunder the temples that Dr. George Jim James in his book, The Stolen Legacy, does a great work on that book. Mm-hmm. And he got him to plunder the temples and house it in the Alexandria Library. Well, the Greeks, who later they were the Ptolemies, same people, they were there for 300 years, Brother Rock, study. <clears throat> The Romans had another 400 years, and then the Byzantine Romans had another 400 years. We're talking over a thousand years. They studied these ancient papyruses that they plundered from the temples of ancient Kemet. So no matter what we look at, whether we're looking at the church, whether we're looking at the synagogue, whether we're looking at the mosque, whether we're looking at the Masonic order of the Western world, whether we're looking at Greek philosophy, all of it can be traced back to Kemet. That's why there was a fear of ancient Kemet. That's why Justinian in the 4th and 6th century AD, Justinian and Theodosius, they shut these temples down. Theodosius in the 4th century AD and Justinian in the 6th century AD, why did they shut them down? For the fear that this knowledge would reveal where they were getting and starting the Western world from this point and the Western church. They only dug these temples out in the turn of the century. To make Torah's dollars, but not to tell the truth. But fortunately, even though the papyruses were robbed and they put that in the Alexandria Library, we know about the Alexandria Library, but nobody nobody tells where they where the knowledge came from, from those temples of ancient Kemet. It was long before. It took thousands of years, Brother Rock, for the Kushite Kemetic Africans to develop this knowledge. Yeah. And even though that library was burned down, but they carved endlessly on the temple. That's what makes the temple so powerful. So when you see the medical instruments, when you're seeing spiritual systems that are carved in stone, here you see the stethoscopes carved in stone is right there. Here you see the medical instruments that we talked about a minute ago that the sister broke down and cried about. Yeah. Here we see other spiritual ideas where the, the Nisu is giving praise to that star that told that Haru would be born of a holy birth and immaculate conception. This was the fear of the Western church had of ancient Egypt. That if this knowledge would be revealed, how could they create a belief system? When we have the facts of how this was corrupted and distorted in the making of the Western version of Christianity. Brother, may you enjoy continued good health because you speak a truth and have a knowledge that is so absolutely important and critical. I want to thank you so very much for coming with me today and 
I don't say this um, in any way other than being wholly genuine. I need to have you back on more. I certainly will look to stay connected with you and look to a time where we can do this again. Yes, sir. It's been a great honor, Brother Rock, and I definitely enjoyed it. And I know that um, I was uh, keeping it with the time period. I call these theme times. And uh, theme times is a time when our people, as we've been talking about, are caught within this uh, this whole system right now. We're caught within the circumference uh, right now. And uh, this is where the, the worst form of enslavement is spiritual enslavement. Yeah. And I just want to say once again, brother will be at uh, uh, Everlasting Life Restaurant in Capitol Heights, Maryland, this sa Saturday, December the 9th. Doors All open. visual documentation. Yeah, absolutely. And it will be about, uh, I've been doing a presentation, uh, African Origin of Christianity. Um, in the Christmas holiday. That's right. That's right. On, during, the, during, the, during the season. <laughs> Again, thank you so much, and I look forward to the next time we can do this. Folks, yes, that wraps us up for this evening. Thank you, Brother God Ross. bless you for tuning in. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs>